How about we add some fluid stains to our models? In this video, I want to look at the process of adding stains and fluid effects to our models. These are things that come generally from inside the vehicle. Uh, transmission fluid, oil, things like that. So it's leaks and spills and other things like that. And I make that distinction because it's not going to be talking about earth effects uh, such as dirt and dust and other things like that. While the application techniques are very similar, the considerations for fluid stains are different enough that I think that they can be a distinct uh, class of things on their own. Whenever I'm thinking about adding stains and fluid leaks to my models, there's several considerations that I try to keep in mind to help guide me along the way. The first of these is scale. Now I'd say the first thing that I think about in terms of scale is do I care or not? Um, because sometimes there are things that I want to do in a big exaggerated way and I'm not as worried about scale. So you can, you can very quickly decide is scale part of my thinking or not. If it's not, don't even worry about it. If it is though, then certainly thinking in terms of how big is a human next to this vehicle because it then lets you get kind of a reference in your mind as if you were standing next to it. What would make sense? Is this stain as big as my hand? Is it as long as my arm? Is it as wide as my body? Having that frame of reference, I think, really helps in terms of staining uh, and streaks and things like that so that there is some level of realism involved. Another thing I like to consider is the location of stains and leaks. Just as with any real vehicle, these are generally going to be centered around places where there's an access hatch, uh, some kind of filler cap, uh, something that moves, some kind of joint. It's not so much going to be on a wide open area with nothing around it. Sure, there are things that can get spilled there, but the more likely place that you're going to see, for instance, say uh, uh, some spilled gasoline is near the gas cap. If you're going to want to replicate a coffee stain, it's probably going to be somewhere near where the crew gets on or off the vehicle or sits in an open hatch or something like that. So whenever I'm putting stains and fluid leaks and things like that on a vehicle, I spend a little time looking over it and looking for the most likely candidates. And again, that can be a fuel cap. It can be an oil cap. It can be where there's some parts moving that may have hydraulic fluid or grease coming out. It can be any number of stain, but I try to identify where do I want to put the stains. And when you get to thinking about the types of fluid stains that you can see on a vehicle, there's a lot of them. It can be gasoline. It can be diesel, transmission fluid, radiator fluid, any other kind of fluid, such as hydraulic fluid. There can be stains from uh, like I had mentioned earlier, coffee spills. There can be blood. Uh, there can be things that you don't know necessarily what it is, but it's some kind of leaking stain. The takeaway, though, is think about some types of stains that you want and where those are going to go in terms of location so that there's a little bit of a story to it. Having a backstory in your mind, even if it's just a few thoughts, of there's going to be a lot of fluid leaks and oil leaks on this thing and around this part there's going to be a lot of grease stains. That's enough of a story to drive the modeling that you're going to apply to your, your project. Now going hand in hand with the type of fluid stains that you want to add is your color choices. Uh, certainly we know the color of a fluid stain for oil or transmission fluid or anything like that. If you've ever looked at any kind of vehicle that had real world vehicle that had staining, you know that there can be slightly different colors. You know, if you look in the parking lot of my office, you see all the various fluid stains coming out from underneath my old car. So there can be a lot of different colors. So the color choice will help indicate what type of fluid it is. I also like to think about how will that color contrast with the rest of what I'm going to be doing on the model. Can it be seen against the base color? Does it clash too terribly with other colors? 
if I'm going to have a lot of earth or earth type of effects on it and I'm going to have a lot of chipping and then I'm going to have a lot of fluid stains, it can be real easy that everything will just become this kind of mishmash hodgepodge of brownish stuff. And so sometimes when I'm picking the colors for the fluid stains, I try to make sure that there's going to be a distinction between the other effects that I'm trying to achieve. Even if it's at the sacrifice of some realism, I want to make sure that I'm getting the notion across that this is not a chip, this is not mud, this is a fluid stain. Fluid stains can also be a subtle way to draw attention towards certain points on the model. Let's say you've done some particular scratch building that you think looks pretty good and you want people to notice that. While you can certainly use chipping or earth effects around that, fluid stains are one way of really showing here's something to take a look at. It, maybe it draws the eye to it. And again, that can be through a heavier application, it can be through color, but the stains can draw attention to something that you want the viewer to take note of on the model. Something else I try to keep in mind when it comes to fluid stains is thinking about the finish of the stain. And by that I mean, is it going to be matte? Is it going to be more satin? Is it going to be glossy? Newer stains of fluid tend to be glossy. Older ones tend to be matte and they're going to collect more dirt. They're going to collect more grime and things like that. If you've ever uh, opened up you know, uh, the engine uh, compartment of your car and maybe it's really old, there may be some areas where there's clumps of oil, where it's pulled in dirt and dust and other things, and it's kind of clumpy looking. If there's fresh oil, it's going to be much more glossy and it's going to look like liquid. So keeping the finish of the fluids in mind is going to help you in terms of realism and getting the notion across. And I think it's a good thing to have multiple types of it because on any area where there's going to be fluid stains, there may be ages of those fluid stains. So you may have some that are older and more matte and then others that are fresher and glossy. And that is a very interesting detail to add to the model. I also like to think in terms of the direction of the fluid streak or stain because if it's on a vertical surface, of course, it's going to flow downwards if it's something that happens while it's stationary or if it's not a fast moving vehicle. But if it's an airplane or a flying vehicle or a spaceship and that stain happens while it's in flight, even though it may be a surface that is vertical, it may appear as a horizontal streak because it happens while in flight and thus is subject to uh, wind and, and things like that, pushing it back along the, the surface of the, the model. So I like to think in terms of what direction would this happen and mixing those up a bit. If it's going to be on a horizontal surface, I like to keep in mind, okay, is this a very flat surface so it's going to pull up in this area and not really go anywhere or is it more of a slanted surface and it's going to go in one direction and then translate into a, a different type of streak on a more vertical surface after that transition. So thinking in terms of where it is on the model, the effects of gravity on it, and what direction it's going to go will help add to the realism of what you're doing. Now the first type of fluid standing that I want to demonstrate is using enamel products. Now to demonstrate the use of some enamel products for streaks and stains and things like that, I'm going to use this AK Interactive Aircraft Engine Oil. Now, I, I'm using this just because it will show up nicely on this color. It's a good color to use. Um, it's kind of a dark brown, but it's not so much that I'm recommending that this is the color that you use, but rather this is a color I'm using for contrast purposes. There's a wide variety of enamel products that you can use. The key to both enamels and oils is to remember that it's a subtractive process in general, meaning you put some of the product on and then as I'm going to demonstrate, you do other methods to take some of it off to get it to looking exactly like you want. Now I highly recommend that you stir up your enamel products with some kind of electric stir tool. You can stir it around manually, you can shake it, but generally um, what I've found is it, it takes me a while with this stir tool 
to get this thoroughly mixed. And I would not want to try and replicate that with uh, uh, doing it by hand in, in any way. <laughs> now I have that aircraft engine oil enamel product here that I just showed in my palette. And I've also got some enamel odorless thinner. What I'm using today is from Ammo of MIG, but any, any enamel odorless thinner will do. You don't have to use the same brand. I mean, here I'm using uh, AK and MIG together and you know, they don't get along, <laughs> but at least on my palette, they will. Now to continue with the, the line of thinking that, that these are, um, that this is an additive process. What, what I tend to do, this is the basic work method that I use for enamels and oils, uh, anytime, because what I do is I add in the product where I want the streak to be. And you can see that's kind of transparent. So uh, you can add in additional and I put it in basically the length that I want the, the streak or the stain to be. And then, I may even make it a little longer and I don't worry about the width of it because I'm going to go back and clean that up. But I put that where I want it. Now I can put it in a streak like that. I can put it up along something underneath it like that. I can put it out in the middle if I want it to look like something that's, you know, been spilled on the surface regardless of the shape of the stain that you put on there. And if you get too much on there, like I just did, wick your brush off and then go in and just pick that up. But no matter what the shape of the stain, the cleanup process is essentially the same. So let me give this just a few minutes to dry. When it's no longer gloss, I'll know it's ready to keep working with. Now I sped the drying process up with a hair dryer, but, um, if you just wait for it to dry on its own, it'll take 10 minutes, 15 minutes, and it's ready to work with. You can work with it up to several hours after it's dried. But now what I'm going to do is I've cleaned my brush off, and I'm going to just dip it down into this odorless thinner, and then I'm going to work most of that off onto my paper towel here. And then I'm going to begin going in alongside of it with my thinner. I'm just going to start slowly working my way over towards where that streak is and letting the thinner activate that enamel and just begin working that stain down to the width and the, the appearance that I want. And I'll just go back to the other side and just kind of bring it in from there. And it's very configurable because you can get it looking exactly like you want. You can, if you decide that it's too long, you can come in and just kind of cut it off like that and work it. I like to work it so that it looks like it just kind of trails off into nothing. So you can angle in the cleanup like that, but it's just a back and forth process of making that streak look like you want. Now further up there where I had put that, that other stuff, I can just go in and I begin pushing back at the edge. That's the method I like to clean that up, to kind of blend that, to just push it back. It kind of pushes the color across the surface. Remember, this is a satin surface and it just pushes it back towards that area up there and just leaves a little bit of that grime right there so that we have a streak. And because I can clean this up, if I don't like it, I could take a Q-tip damp it in the thinners and just wipe it right away. So this is the basic method for cleaning up oils and enamels. You're just essentially subtracting from the edge of it and thinning the opacity a bit. Now over here with stains like this, a lot of times what I like to do is once I get the color down, I begin to just blend it around in general. I'm not necessarily going at the edges but I start reducing the opacity and here you can see, I'm going to use a lot of it because I clumped a bunch of that on there, but I start reducing the opacity and playing with that and letting the color flow around inside that pool of, of, uh, of thinner there. And again, I just keep 
working it until I get it looking like I want. Occasionally cleaning off my brush, wicking up the stuff, and then I'll let that dry. And if there's any tide marks that I don't want around there where the thinner is, I just go in and clean up those tide marks. Everything that I do in terms of enamel and oil weathering is some variation on these processes right here. The shape may be different. The color may be different. Um, I may swap up brushes every now and then to use something a little bigger, a little smaller, but generally I use something like this. But just about everything I do is going to be a variant of these basic methods right here. Using enamels is a tried and true way to get some really good staining on your models. Using oils gives you all the benefits that you have with enamels with even more flexibility that the oils bring along for blending. Now for the oils, I'm going to use this Starship Filth from 502 Ab Tai Lung. This is, this is a good brand of modeling oils that I highly recommend. Um, they've got a wide range of colors and they work really well. This is, this is some good stuff. If you only get 502 Ab Tai Lung, you're doing fine. Now what I do with oils is unless I'm going to be wanting it as a wash consistency where I would thin it in my oil. If you saw the previous video uh, in this series, uh, you'll, you'll recall what I'm talking about. If I'm not going to be making it into a wash, I like to put it on a piece of cardboard. One, it lets the oils in there leach out so that it will dry a little faster. I'm using the same odorless enamel that I did with the enamels that I just demonstrated. But the workflow I like with this is if I want to just place some of the just pure color uh, let's say along here, I can do that and take advantage of how oils have the ability to be blended very nicely. If I were just doing it like I did the enamel streaking, it would be the exact same method. I would put in a streak and then blend away the edges just like I showed. So what I want to do here is show some ways that oils can be used that are a little different than enamels. They have an advantage over enamels. But you see, I just put in some of that straight color right there. Now I'm gonna take this worn out flat brush that I've used for stuff like this many times, and I wanna begin just stippling, stippling action right there. And do you see how it starts spreading that oil out and starts kind of giving a hazy line right there? And you can work that off and then begin pushing the oil back to it if you want, pulling it across, streaking it down, and it gives you the ability to make very blurred lines, almost a pre-shaded look, but it can make it look dirtier and grimier because of the ability to blend oils and because of working with their transparency. It's, it's such good, um, good at being blended. I can go in here and I can dip my brush in the thinner and I can begin getting a little bit of that on there. And I can go back in and I can work some in like that. And if I wanted to just leave those streaks there like that to look like little, little oil you know, stains coming out, I could do that. I can take a Q-tip and I can just kind of smudge those a bit. And because of the transparency of oils, I can work with so many different opacities, it just gives me the ability to tune and dial that look in exactly like I want and have it looking whatever I can imagine, I can make it happen with oils. Now another way that oils can be very configurable is if you get a little on the end of a flat brush like this and then you can actually use them for dry brushing. So like over grates and stuff like this, they're great, you get it, see what I did there? They're great for dry brushing and for just kind of smudging around and creating a, a soot stained effect, um, the effect of just oil and grease and grime collecting. Uh, you can really uh, get this configured to look exactly like you want. You see how it's imparting that color on there. I've even used it for chipping. Um, doing some dry brush type chipping. But oils, because of that opacity and because of that ability to be blended, they allow you to be a lot more creative in terms 
of how you apply them and how you make use of them on the model. Oils and enamels give great flexibility in terms of blending and other methods like that when it comes to fluid stains, but we do have to shake hands with the drying time. Acrylics can be used for fluid stains and you don't have to worry near as much about the drying time because they're generally going to be dry in just a couple of minutes. The application technique is a little different, but I feel like everything that you can do with oils and enamels, there's a way to accomplish it with acrylics. Now to demonstrate the use of acrylics, I'm just going to use a very simple Citadel shade, uh, Agrax Earth shade. It's basically a very thin brown acrylic wash and it's matte. But you can use dedicated weathering products such as uh, from Vallejo's weathering effects line. They have things like this fuel stains, they have oil stains, they have lots of stain products that you can use. Anything like that is going to work, but the application principle is the same. You want this to be generally an additive, or a, yes, an additive method. Um, I sometimes get confused and want to say subtractive because I say that so much with oils and enamels. Now, if you notice, if I put this on straight out of the pot, it's a very intense color. Now, I use a fine pointed brush and I use a stippling motion to get a stain. So I can build that stain in that looks really good right off from the, the start. And you see it's, it's as fine or even more refined than what I had done with the enamels, although I could have gotten the enamel stain to look just like this. Um, but you can put it on in a very fine stippling motion like that. But what I generally like to do is to get a little bit in my palette like this. And then over in this well over here, I have some water. And what I can do when I mix it in with some water, it reduces the opacity. And then I offload most of that from my brush. And you see how much is on there. I'm still able to get a fairly fine line from that. And then I can go in and I can stipple that in just like I did before, but it's going to dry at a little less opacity. And what I can do is once that dries, I can then decide, do I want to add more to it? Do I want to build up some? Do I want to reduce the opacity even more so that I can build up the effect as I want to? And thus I can go in and, for example, I could put some on like this. Let me get a little more on my brush there. I could put some on like this in a fairly wide area like that. And all I'm doing is just dancing the tip of the brush across the surface of the model. I can dance it on like that. And then once that dries, I can go in and use some of the full on mixture straight out of the bottle to enhance just a small portion of that to help that look like a stain. So using acrylics is very easy, very fast. It just takes a different application technique because once this is dry, let me dry it with a hairdryer. Let me hit it with a hairdryer real quick and show you what I'm talking about. All right, that was about 15 seconds with a hairdryer and you can see how I can make that work really well for me. Now acrylics can leave tide marks every now and then, but sometimes I think that looks pretty good. So what I'll do is I'll put some water on the model like that and just kind of spread it around. Because this is a satin surface, I'm kind of having to chase it, but that's all right. And then what I do is I just take either straight on or some of my thinned color and I just get that on my brush and touch that in there a couple of times and that imparts some of the color to that. And then I'll dry that with my hair dryer and you can see the stain pattern that that leaves. Having stain patterns like that around the model adds to the interest. Not every stain has to be a solid full-on stain like that because there are uh, liquids that dry like that. I especially like using this to make to simulate coffee stains near hatches because uh, I know from experience that Crew members in vehicles drink coffee and sometimes they spill it on the vehicle. So having things like that in there, I think, just adds to the realism. 
Now, there are other alternatives to oils, enamels, and acrylics. I've used both pencils and pigments to do staining, and I like using both. I tend to combine them with some of the other methods, but they can be used as standalone techniques in and of themselves. Here's a quick demo of a method using an AK interactive weathering pencil. I've got some water here in my palette, and I just set the pencil right there, and I just touch the brush to it a little bit, get it wet, and that gets a little bit of color on my brush. I wick that off, and I can do as I did with the other acrylics, and just go in and stipple on some staining right there like that. And when that dries, I've got a nice little stain. These pencils can be really fast and easy for that. Now the products I've demonstrated, I think that enamels are probably the easiest to get started in if you've never done this type of thing before. However, I would advocate for using all of them, trying all of them out, because the flexibility that each of them brings to the table, the strengths that each of them brings to the table, can be weighed against the disadvantages that each one of them has. Even though the disadvantages of all of them are small, those can be weighed against each other and you can pick which one is right for the situation that you're working in. Generally, I like to use at least two different methods just because they give different finishes and different looks and different drying times. For example, I can do a lot of the big staining with acrylics and get those large areas of stain in and use a lot of thinner in it so that it's more transparent and very subtle and then I can go over the top with oils and then do blending and those acrylics give me a good base that I can have and I can put it in place and it dries really quick and then I can put the oils on top of it and set it aside to dry and I've got a really good look, a really good effect. So practicing in all of them, I think, is the key to long-term success and is going to put more tools in your modeling toolbox. Well, thank you so much for watching this video. I hope it's been helpful. If you're new to weathering, I hope that this has given you some ideas to think about and some things to try on your own models. And even if you've already been weathering for a while, I hope that there's been a few things in here that have given you some ideas to try out or some methods to take a look at that maybe you hadn't used before. I'd be grateful if you'd click the subscribe link down over here and hit the little bell icon so you'll know when I have new videos come out. And also, leave this video a like and drop a comment down below if you would. That helps me grow the channel and I just like hearing from people. I like to know, are these videos helping? Uh, have you found them useful? Are there other techniques and ideas that you have that you use on your models? Or are there other techniques that you would like demonstrated that maybe I could put in a future video? There's also a link down below for Patreon if you'd like to support this channel. And if you're already a supporter of this channel, thank you so much for being a patron. You make this video possible. And with all that being said, I'll leave you with one final thought, as I always like to do. In this hobby, if you're not having fun, you're doing it wrong. Happy day to you, friends. Bye-bye.